Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. What's up, everybody? Hope you're having a great day. Small request, if after listening to or watching the video, you find you enjoyed it or learned something, do me a favor, smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. Now, let's dig in. According to the New York Post, Alleged serial killer Rex Hurman has been in touch with his estranged wife, Asa Ellerup. Ellerup has had personal conversations with her husband since his arrest. The conversations have been over the phone. Nothing about the nature of the chats has been released. Ellerup, who's been married to Rex for more than two decades, would have spousal immunity and could not be compelled to testify against him during a trial. But by all accounts, there's no indication she knew about her husband's alleged crimes. Boy, oh boy, would I like to be a fly on the wall during those conversations. I'm assuming she's probably asked him, did you do this? And he's like, no, babe, I didn't do it. I swear, I didn't do it. So he's been acclimating to his new life behind bars at the Suffolk County Jail. And the sheriff there, Errol Toulon, what a name, Errol Toulon, sounds like an actor, who's guarded other notorious inmates, including mob boss John Gotti, the preppy killer Robert Chambers, who just got out of prison, the subway shooter Bernie Getz, and more, doesn't seem concerned about having the hulking Hewerman in his facility. Per Toulon, Hewerman's day begins when breakfast is served. And after that, it's up to him what he wants to do that day. I mean, they can't stick him on a chain gang yet because he hasn't been convicted, right? He's still innocent until proven guilty. He can go back to bed. He can take a shower. It sounds like they're clearing the showers out before he goes in. So he's probably safe for now in there. He can watch TV on a shared television from inside his cell, or he can read. But according to the sheriff, so far, Hewerman doesn't have any reading materials in his cell. He could get a newspaper or a book if he wants to, but again, so far, he hasn't requested those. He can also receive care packages, but none have arrived so far, and no family members or friends have visited him, although we know now that his wife has been in contact via the telephone. So now I'm thinking that the wrinkled suit and pants that he had on in court yesterday were likely sent over there from the family home. He can also buy snacks and basic necessities in the commissary if he has money on his books. It's hard to say if Ellerup would have put any money on those books for him at this point. You think she'd be rather pissed off about it all and tell him, hey, you don't need those ramen noodles and Snickers bars as I'm dealing with our messed up house, you selfish son of a gun. So far, three news organizations have asked for interviews with him. Apparently, Hewerman has not said much more than yes or no to his jailers. He hasn't tried to engage in conversation. The only other thing he said is that he will comply with the rules of his incarceration. Interesting that he wants to play by the rules now after shirking them for years by failing to pay his taxes, going all the way back to 2005. He still owes in excess of $200,000 in back taxes, according to ABC7 News. He's also filed what appear to be four frivolous lawsuits between 2014 and 2022 against drivers that he said hit him with their cars, causing serious and permanent injuries. He seems to be walking okay now, right? He sued one of those drivers for $5 million. And guess what? They settled with him for $55,000. And the lady said he basically put himself right in front of her car, and she did touch him, but it was only a tap. And then there's also the matter of the three, possibly four women that he's accused of doing in. One thing I will say about Ellerup is that she had to have been aware of these four crazy lawsuits. Did she think her husband was crazy 
Or did she believe that he'd really been hit and that he had serious and permanent injuries? Or was she so within his control at that point that she really didn't have a say and there weren't really any logical conversations about these things? But Sheriff Toulon is not holding his breath because he said that over time, he's seen changes in inmates' behavior. They come in saying they're going to follow all the rules, and then later they end up breaking them. So far, the sheriff has seen Hewerman four times while doing his rounds. Apparently, Toulon makes it a habit to walk through all the jails he oversees and to talk to the inmates. Apparently, he learned the profession from his father, who was a deputy warden, and his dad told him that it's important to engage with the inmates because sometimes they may have issues that they don't want to discuss with the corrections officers. When Hewerman first arrived, Toulon introduced himself to him and Hewerman called him Sir. I'm wondering if this is the crafty, charming part of Hewerman's dual personality and that he's going to do anything right now to prove he's an upstanding gent who isn't guilty. I wonder how Rex felt when he witnessed the prosecutors hand over eight terabytes of evidence to his defense attorneys yesterday, including 2,500 document pages, photos, videos taken at the Hewerman home, as well as the victim's autopsy reports. The state has, after all, 13 years worth of evidence to use against the architect. And the prosecutor said that they're going to keep handing over more evidence in a rolling type of fashion to the defense attorneys. So there's even more evidence coming. The jail that's housing Hewerman is taking, quote, security precautions to ensure that everyone stays safe and alive. Hewerman is being kept in a separate housing area from other inmates, and this is for his safety the safety of the other inmates, and the safety of the staff. So far, Hewerman hasn't lost his appetite. He's been eating, which likely means he's also pooping. He does remain on an aliving watch, but that's standard procedure. But let's go back to the victim's autopsy reports. Victim Melissa Bartholomew was last seen in July of 2009, a year and five months before her remains were found in December of 2010. Victim Megan Waterman went missing on June 6 of 2010, and Amber Costello disappeared into the night on September 2nd of 2010. So the last two victims' remains were discovered six months and three months after they went missing. The fourth victim found in that cluster on Gilgo Beach, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, disappeared in 2007. So I'm thinking maybe that's why it's been harder to get the evidence to prove Hewerman did her in. It would seem that Megan and Amber's remains should have yielded the most clues as to what exactly was done to them. We know three of the four victims ultimately died from having something put around their necks and their breath taken from them, and one had something put down her throat, which also led to her being unable to breathe. What is not so clear is what their final John might have done to them in the way of inflicting pain along the path to death. Hewerman is said by experts to be someone who finds pleasure, meaning the wink-wink kind of pleasure, in inflicting pain on his victims. It's been alleged that he used belts and tape to tie up the naked victims, and one belt with the initials WH was found with victim Maureen Brainerd Barnes' remains. I'm going to speculate that he likely had some perverse setup in that walk-in basement vault of his in the family home, where he kept all the tools of his pain game. Lord knows what exact sick actions turned him on. His many online searches likely tell part of that story and that drawing of a bruised blonde woman's face carried out of the Hewerman home also, I think, may shed light on what these poor young women endured 
at his large marble-like hands. Of course, so far the investigators have only said they believe Hewerman may have done in at least one victim at his home. So the police aren't saying that at least at this point, that all the victims died at the Hewerman home. But we do know that two of the Gilgo Beach victims' cell phones traveled to Massapequa Park, Long Island, where the Hewerman home is, in the days around when they vanished. Victim Melissa Bartholomew's last phone location was recorded in Massapequa Park around 1.43 a.m. on July 11th of 2009. Remember, she was last seen alive on July 10th. Cell tower records also show that victim Megan Waterman's cell phone traveled to Massapequa Park on the day she disappeared, and its last recorded location in that area was at 3.11 a.m. in the vicinity of the Hewerman home. Victim Amber Costello unfortunately left her phone at home when she walked outside it and was never seen again. In Amber's case, a burner phone, I'm assuming one of the seven registered to Rex Hewerman, contacted her the day before she vanished. That phone connected to cell towers in West Amityville and Massapequa Park. That same burner phone messaged Amber early on September 2nd, 2010, the last day she was seen alive from Massapequa Park. And later that night, that same burner phone traveled to the area near Amber's home. Based on all of this, I think the Red House needs a lot more than a good saging. I heard a lawyer who attended Hewerman's court hearing yesterday say that when he shuffled into the courtroom, you could feel the evil. And she said she's not usually one to say such things, but the evil was palpable. I have to believe that some evil vibe permeates that house, despite the three poor souls who are forced at the moment to live there. Maybe the tears the adult children are shedding at night are not coming just from their own plight, but also are born out of the deep sorrow inside those walls. I'm hoping the GoFundMe for Asa Ellerup and her kids will allow them to sell the Red House and move, and then I'm hoping the buyer tears that monstrosity down so that the neighbors do not have to live with a constant visual reminder of this scary and painful chapter in their lives. That's all for now. Thank you for the privilege of your time today. I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time on Bed Crime Stories. Do me a favor, smash that like button, and consider subscribing. See ya!